Hello, and welcome to another episode of Boundless Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you now. Logan Herlihy is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out his first appearance on Boundless Body Radio on episode 512, titled Reformed Fitness with Logan Herlihy. Logan Herlihy is a leader in the evidence-based exercise field and is the director of health and wellness for Reformed Fitness, an online health coaching and personal training company with clients all over the world. Reformed Fitness 63-day body, total body transformation program helps busy professionals shed 10 pounds of fat in nine weeks with realistic and sustainable habit building and personalized health coaching tailored to the client. Logan has personally supervised over 20,000 resistance training sessions after seven years in the fitness industry. He is an author, and his first book, How to Look Good Naked, is available now on Amazon. He's hoping to have a second book launched in late 2024 titled Exercise is Bullshit, and is launching a podcast in quarter three of 2024 with the same name. As a speaker, Logan has given lectures nationally and internationally on health and fitness. You can reach Logan at loganherlihy at gmail.com or schedule a free discovery call at www.reformed-fitness.com. Logan Herlihy, what an absolute honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. Yeah, it's always a pleasure to see you, Case. I can't believe, how many episodes have you done now? Uh, we're somewhere over 600. I know it's a lot. That's wild. Yeah. That's awesome, man. It's weird. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, it's been really fun. When we started in 2020, um, we had just started our company. And, you know, it wasn't like we were like super busy making tons and tons of money. It was just mostly the clients that we had from before and trying to figure out new ways to work with our clients and whatever. And so podcasting, like I had more time for it. And so it was just really quick that I really fell in love with the process. And so many people were, that were awesome, like yourself, said yes. And so I just, we got in the, the, the habit of just releasing episodes Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And if you're, you know, know, really stubborn and bullheaded and never stop, you'll have a lot of things uh, to show for it in the end. So that's kind of where we are. Yeah, three times a week is a lot as I'm putting together my new, uh, new podcast. Now it's like, I'm, I'm debating going weekly or biweekly just because it's it's a lot of effort. So that's super commendable, man. That's awesome. Well, thanks. Um, and it is really important, I would say, as you know, as, as a consumer podcast, you know, for the people out there listening who want to start a podcast, be really thoughtful about the cadence that you want to do because I think we all understand the feeling of expecting a podcast on a certain day and it doesn't show up. It can like ruin your whole day. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, legitimately can can lose subscribers and things for you for sure. Because yeah, it's uh it's frustrating when you have something that you do listen to religiously and you've listened to all of them and it's like well, I'm not gonna go back and listen to something else. Like I'll just find something else entirely. And then you know I can't imagine how many untold losses there've been for podcasts who just decided, yeah, we're just gonna take a hiatus and not let anybody know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seriously. Well, awesome, man. We mentioned the twenty thousand workouts that you've done in your life all without causing any injury, which I think is wonderful. We can add one more to that tally because since you are here in the valley, we both work out in the same place. Huge shout out to the refinery and Jess and John who do an amazing job with an incredible facility that you and I both work out at. I've had the opportunity to go through the workout that you provide and, and to experience that firsthand. Now I would say that you and I train in a very similar way. We both practice what is called high intensity training, which I really want to talk about today, but doing, doing that session with you that day, um, that was quite a workout. Let me just leave it at that. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, uh, well, yeah, shout out to the refinery, shout out to to John and Jess. They're they're just the best. And the culture in that gym is just world class. I mean, it's it's so cool to to have a place that feels like home. Um, you know, especially because my fiance and I are newer to Utah and so so just the welcoming atmosphere that we feel in that place is, has just been awesome. Um, and yeah, I mean there's there's so many flavors and varieties of of high intensity training as you've you've probably come to see. And I think it's interesting anytime you get different practitioners together, because you're always going to have a different perspective on essentially what we're doing is the same thing, right? But how are we going to deliver that uh, and execute on it and, and, you know, create an experience for the client that's going to keep them wanting to come back and obviously keep them as safe as possible. Yeah, well, you did a great job with that when you and I did our workout together. Um, just just the way you would, I would be completely spent. Like my hamstrings were done, dude. And you're like, okay, three more. And I was like, what What are you talking about? Three more? There's no three more. And, and the way you assist as far as the machine and help the person kind of negatively unload the weight was really, really helpful. I remember my triceps cramping when I was doing a leg press. <laughs> 
that's what kind of uh, depth of intensity you put me through on that day. And so I would say that day I wasn't, you know, super friendly with you, but I, I really appreciated going there because I think without having somebody take you to that level of effort, not many people are going to be willing to take themselves as deep as they need to go to really truly experience that. So I really appreciated that. Yeah, no, it was my pleasure, man. And I think uh, a lot of times, you know, people think they push themselves hard. And I am by no means saying that I'm like the hardest worker in the room. But what I've learned over the years in this industry specifically is it requires like if you want to get the absolute most out of yourself, you have to have somebody else there. Now, you can make an argument that maybe that's not actually um, necessary, depending on what style of training you're doing and how often you're training to actually get every last ounce of energy and, and effort out of you on every single exercise. Um, and I'm sure we'll talk about that a little bit more. But if that's your goal, if your goal is to work as hard as humanly possible, um, you know, I was talking with uh, Jay Vincent uh, the other day, who you may or may not know, is sort of a, a high intensity training Instagram influencer, really smart guy, really nice guy. Um, super well educated on on high intensity training, and and we were sort of talking about that idea that you need you require somebody else to be there if the goal is as much effort as humanly possible. It's almost impossible to get to that point on your own. Maybe there's a few exceptions to that rule, but they are few and far between for sure. I agree with you a hundred percent. I love talking about the value that a personal trainer truly provides. When I first started in this industry, I got my certification, and I thought that I would be hired as a personal trainer to create the perfect program design to nail exactly the right number of sets and reps and an order of exercise that made the perfect sense that would be perfect for this person's goals. And I learned really early on, people cared a lot less about that. And also that so many different modalities would really work. It didn't matter if you were like, crazy specific with everything that you were doing as much as it was like you were the person that showed up at the same day and same time. Like my clients at 6am, I showed up at their house, I'm waiting on their porch and they said, you know what, Casey, like if you weren't here, we'd still be asleep. That's the value. They've been consistent with their workouts because of that. Um, there's also the value of a trainer who is, you know, becoming family with somebody. They're talking with somebody and providing support and not necessarily always telling people what to do, but asking questions and helping people think critically on their own so they can make their own decisions. And I think what you said about a trainer being able to push you that next level is absolutely true. There's no chance, no chance that I would have pushed myself to the level of depth that you helped me achieve in that workout. And so it's just interesting to see what the true value of personal training really is. Yeah. And I think sometimes it's lost on people like us who are in the industry and are, who are going through the motions of that every single day. Um, so it can be cool to be reminded of that. Like I, I got the opportunity to you know, I've been training this guy virtually for a number of years and and he was in town last week and, and we got the opportunity to work together in person, which we've only ever been able to do like two or three times. And I mean, he's, he's like you said, he's become family. He's become a, a really close friend of mine, I would even say. And it's just awesome to not just have the connection from a training perspective where he knows the value that I bring to the table and constantly reminds me of it, which is just a good uh, feeling of, you know, reassurance, like, oh, okay, what I'm doing is making a difference, but also like the connection that you create with people when you do hold them accountable, like people like to be held accountable. Some people, not everyone. <laughs> Um, but people that are self-aware um, and I feel like have goals and want to attain things and want to be a better version of themselves every every single day have to have other people in their lives that hold them accountable. It doesn't have to be a personal trainer, but whatever the aspect is that you're trying to improve on, whether it's mentorship and business or you're trying to become you know, a better whatever, a pilot or something like that, you have to have somebody that's holding you accountable, making sure that you're doing the right things. And we serve a, a, a really critical role in doing that in people's lives. So it's, it's pretty awesome. I love that. I remember several years ago watching a documentary about um, caddies in golf um, and what they do and how they assist the golfer. And I really think of personal trainers like that as well. When you and I were doing our workout, like to be able to set up a machine exactly the right way, I didn't really have to think about it. I just had to do the lift. You knew exactly the machine, exactly the settings, all that stuff. I know that I could have asked you at any point, why are we doing this? But I, I you know, I, I realized that I, I either already know or I don't really care. But again, like relating that to like a golfer and a caddy, like a personal trainer should be taking care of all that stuff for you. They should be able to explain at any given time, what are you doing? Why are you doing it? Why do we choose this machine in this order? What are we focusing on? How is this relating to my goals? But also, again, that bond, that closeness is a big part of it. And so I think all of that, again, just really illustrates the, the value of hiring a trainer, even if it's just for a short period of time. 
Yeah. And I mean, you, you mentioned a little bit earlier about when we first get into this industry about how we have this, um, you know, this grand idea that we're going to create the program that's going to be the perfect program for every single person. And I think you quickly start to realize after you've done this for a while that there is no such thing, right? Um, if anything, our goal should be to help people to work as hard as possible with whatever their goals are. Um, so I think this idea that we have to like be programming gurus and you have to reinvent the wheel with every single person that comes in. I honestly would say err on the side of being as simple as possible until that person goes, is there any other stuff we can do? Right. Because if you get the fundamentals down, if you get the big things down, big compound lifts, making sure more than anything that they're understanding your client is understanding what intensity looks like, what effort actually looks like, man, I mean, you get 95% of the way to your goals just through doing those fundamental things. And then it's like some, you know, some sprinkles on top, if you want to add in some other fun exercises and things like that, that might keep them engaged over the long term. I love that. Yeah, keeping people engaged is such a good point. And that's where, you know, more variety can come in. Obviously, like you said, starting without foundation is so important. And then building on that over time to just if nothing else to keep that person engaged, I think is really important. And that's such a good segue to your, your latest content exercises bullshit. I really want to deep dive into some of the concepts you explore with that. But before we do, um, it's been a minute. Can you remind our listeners how you got into health and fitness to begin with and, and help us explain how you got into uh, high intensity training specifically, because I think it's a, a kind of a, a, a lost training style. It seems very esoteric, even though it's something that's been around for a long time. Yeah, it seems actually that uh, that hits making a comeback in in certain different ways. Um, there's there's some businesses out there that are growing, and it seems like Mike Mentor all of a sudden is like a big figure in bodybuilding again, which is kind of cool to see. Um, but my story was, you know, I was always into fitness, so I always lifted since I was like 14 on. Um, classic story of just I was really small, I wanted to get big, I was sick of getting picked on, and you know, being skinny, and um, that started working, and so I, I fell in love with the gym and. Um, I just did, you know, for lack of a better word, dumb bro stuff for about 10, 10 to 15 years almost of my lifting career. Um, and then when I uh, moved to Minnesota to get sober in 20, gosh, 17 now, I guess, uh, I started with a, a super slow facility. So for your listeners that don't know, super slow is like, if you think hit is esoteric, uh, super slow is like a sub sub niche of high intensity training that's just um, literally what it sounds like, super slow um, repetitions in either direction. So your positive and your negative are both 10 seconds in either direction, super controlled environment, usually 20 minutes or less for the workouts, only five to seven exercises. Um, so I, I got involved with a studio that was doing that. And it was a tremendous change for me physically and mentally. And I just saw absolutely incredible results because I was overtraining. I was, I was training, you know, six days a week, two hours a day kind of thing. So I decreased my volume, you know, tenfold essentially to 20 minutes twice per week and saw tremendous gains. Now at the same time, I was also making drastic changes in my diet. I obviously moved to Minnesota to get sober. So I cut out a lot of other bad, bad things in my lifestyle. Um, and like many of us do, I, I attributed the training to doing most of it, which I think it played a role, but there was obviously so many other um, variables. Anyways, uh, flat fast forward uh, a little bit. And I started with a different company that's based out of Minnesota as well, um, that also does high intensity training, but a little more traditional, I would say more like Arthur Jonesian style, two, four reps, um, some other different cadences. I was there for a few years, um, learned a bunch of stuff, had some great experiences, made some great colleagues. And then recently in about the last month and a half, two months or so, I've moved on to a new company that's entirely virtual um, called Reformed Fitness um, with a couple of, of former colleagues of mine as well. So so we're doing this business together and we can train people all over the world and it's it's been freaking awesome. That's a very cool journey. You were very fortunate to get in with some of the places that you did. I mean, if you'd have started at you know, a, a box gym or a CrossFit gym or whatever, you might have never come across some of this information. Yeah, and and the you know, I think you know, it's partly being exposed to the right people in the right places and the right timing that plays a huge role. But I think I, I genuinely have a, a thirst for knowledge that um, was was just allowed me to to dive a lot deeper than most people would. You know, a lot of people that get exposed to high intensity training just sort of fall into whatever camp they initially fall in with, and they never really change their their attitudes or their ideas. Um, and I've been fortunate enough to be pushed and mentored by, by plenty of people that have basically told me like, keep pushing the boundaries, trying to find, 
you know, don't just accept things at face value, even if they make logical sense, which a lot of the high intensity training principles it did to me. Um, but, you know, you have to balance that over the course of your career with what the research is saying and anecdotal experience. And obviously I've got a lot of that, you know, over 20,000 sessions um, that I've overseen in my career. So it's uh, it's been cool to see that journey and that transition and how that's continued to evolve for me over the years. Yeah, that's amazing. I love the saying, the further away you get from the shore, the deeper the water gets. It's so funny to feel like, you know, you and I have been doing this for quite a while now. And, and like, I feel like I know less and less now than I did when I first started. And there's so many more I don't know it depends and maybes and then there used to be when I first got going in all of this. Yeah. And I think that just goes to show like, as you become more educated, um, as you expose yourself to more knowledge, you do realize the vastness of the amount of, of information that's out there. And, you know, I always tell, tell my clients now, like if you ever come across anybody that's a fitness influencer, that's a, you know, just Instagram, whatever it is, and and they're speaking in absolutes, you should probably just unfollow them right away. Um, because I'm not, I'm not 100% sure about any of this. I've got pretty good evidence to support things um, that I think are right. But there's, there's so much new stuff coming out all the time. There's obviously such uh, vast differences between individuals. Um, so if you're if you're too set in your ways in one way or another, I think you're setting yourself up for disappointment in the long term. And the ability to not work with with a broader audience that could potentially benefit from the knowledge you have, um, but if you can't acquiesce to to whatever the the current situation is then you're just, you're not going to be able to offer that, that knowledge to somebody. I love that. Such a great point. Okay. So for the listener, we've been talking about high intensity training, H I T the listener might be saying, Hey, I know what that is. I've done H I T. IT, high intensity interval training. Um, we know there's lots of companies out there that offer it. I don't want to throw any of them under the bus. So I'm just going to say a name that's similar to the, that won't be too obvious. We'll call it orange method. Um, I don't know. Maybe that's too obvious. We'll call it red theory, right? That, that's a better people won't understand. So I wasn't actually planning on doing that ahead of time. I'm happy that it came out as well as it did in the moment. Uh, but the first person to send me a message and tell me where I stole that from, it was a TV show to give you a little bit of a hint. Um, if you tell me where I stole that bit from, um, I will give you a free personal training session. So message me and the first person to do that will get a free session. High intensity training is different than high intensity interval training. Part of the reason why it's so hard to find information about high intensity training that we're talking about is because there's been such a push for high intensity interval training. If you Google that, that's all you're going to find. It's really, really difficult to find this other information. So can you differentiate the two for us? Yeah, uh, it, it, it is funny too, because I've had clients that will travel before I was doing completely remote work. And I try to set them up with studios that do something similar to what we do across the country. And there's some races, resources for that, but they're very limited. And if you just type in HIT, just H-I-T, training Utah or whatever, it's going to be all red theory studios and other things like that that <laughs> pop up. So um, the biggest differentiator, Casey, is just, um, you know, with interval training, it's typically a blend of cardio and some resistance training or just one or the other. Um, but a lot of times they blend them together. And it's it's more like a Tabata effect where it's the intensity is high, but the intervals are significantly shorter. So you're looking at anywhere from you know, 10 seconds to probably 30, maybe 45 seconds on the high end of an on period, right? Where you'd be doing your sprints on a bike, or you'd be doing your sprints on a rower, or you're doing just bicep curls like crazy, um, depending on where you are in the stations. And then the clock dings, you move on to the next station and you do it all over again, kind of rinse and repeat and go around. And that can be a great way to get your heart rate up. It can be a great way to get you know, big E exercise, if you want to call it that, but it's not very specific, right? You're not actually training any particular pathway. You're training kind of everything all at once, which might sound good, but you can't really progress that over time. So um, it's a good way to work up a sweat. It's not necessarily the best way to get in shape and build muscle and build stamina and build cardiovascular endurance over the long term. So uh, HIT, H-I-T, is typically done with uh, resistance training machines or dumbbells. It can be done with body weight and bands, um, but you're 
focusing on particular movements. Usually it's uh, a max of about a 45 minute session length, um, typically done full body. Um, there's obviously tons of different variety under the hit umbrella. Um, but if we're looking at just the big basics, right? 30 to 45 minutes, um, full body training sessions once or twice per week. So you're taking each exercise instead of doing multi-set training or going around the circle multiple times, taking each exercise to or close to momentary muscular failure. And that's sort of like the big broad definition of HIT. I love that. Yeah, man. So I've done both in my life and you know, the H I I T you are breathing hard. Like you said, you're sweating everywhere. You might be jumping back and forth. I think about risk of injury all the time and how difficult some of those movements can be for everyday people. And at the same time, yes, you're burning a lot of calories and yes, you might feel like you're getting a good workout, but the people who did that the most in my experience were the people that were always frustrated that they were doing all of these classes and all these hard workouts and they'd stand on a body composition scale and complain that for all the work they were doing, nothing was moving in the right direction as far as the body composition, as far as their goals were concerned. And I would try to explain to them, like, look, you're, you're getting good workouts, but you're not following the right principles to what you think you want. It's, it's not the same. It's not equated. And I'd always get pushback, especially from women that would just say like, oh, but I, I need this workout. I need this. And I would just say like, okay, would you rather have a hard workout or would you rather get results? Like choose. But if you want the results, it's a different path. It's not the same path that you think it is. When I'm doing high intensity training, like the time I did it with you, man, like I'm, I'm nose breathing. I am sweating, but I'm moving slowly with control until my muscles are, are like literally can't move. The intensity piece is still very, very high. It's just so different than what people think. Yeah. And that's something I, I talk about in, in the book and exercises bullshit. And I think is, is really prevalent in our industry too, is this idea that hard work, right? H I I T equates to results. And it unfortunately doesn't right. Um, in the beginning, everything works, right? So if you go to a, a you know, an orange theory class, and you do that for a few months and you've never done anything, it's from the couch to Orange Theory, you're probably going to feel better. You're probably going to look a little better. You might even change your body composition a little bit, but you're very quickly going to notice a plateauing effect, um, especially if you're not doing anything from a dietary perspective. And that's regardless of what style of training you're doing. You can train five days a week, but if you're going out and eating like an asshole afterwards, like you can undo all of that work. And I don't care what your splat points say, right? Like that's not a, that's not a good example of giving you extra credit to to go eat eat like an ass afterwards. So um, yeah, I don't know if you follow Ryan Fisher on Instagram at all, but that's that's his big thing. It's always don't eat like an asshole, right? So um, you know, if if you're working hard in the beginning, again, it doesn't really matter what you're doing. Now, if you want to see results, like you said, over the long term, when you're talking to these women, when you're talking to anybody that's coming in and getting frustrated that, hey, I've been training five days a week, 45 minutes each class. It worked in the beginning. It stopped working. Do I need to train more? Like, uh, what am I supposed to do? Two a days now? And people get caught into that. And that's when the injuries start coming. That's when you start getting effects in the sleep. And if you're affecting the sleep, now you might even be gaining more weight, right? Because you're, you're interfering with the recovery pathway. So getting somebody to take a big step back from that or not even do that at all, right? If they just come to, to somebody like you or I in the beginning and we really dial in on how do we progress this over time, that's where you're going to see the improvements, right? We want to make people uh, stronger. We want to make them more resilient. We want to teach them how to work with a high level of intensity. And when we do that and we progress their weights over the long term, they're going to see improvements in their metabolism. They're going to start asking about other positive habits that they can incorporate from like a dietary perspective. Those are the things that are going to create lasting change, not just I'm going to work out five days a week for three months, see how much weight I can lose and not care if it's fat or muscle. So yeah, very well explained. I love that. For all the links I went to, not to mention the company name, you just came right out and mentioned that our legal team sorry. is going to be I'm up sorry. our ass. I can't believe up, it. Up the ass. Slap sorry. points. Oh, man, this is going to be terrible. We're going to get sued. I'm going to pass the bill on to you. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think also, like, I got this from Eric Degotti, if you're familiar with him, where where he said, like, all most people equate a hard workout with soreness. And so he came up with a program that he doesn't even charge for. And I've, I've copied his program because it's great. It's called Come Over to My house at Saturday at eight in the morning. I, there's stuff to do. I'll give you a paint bucket. Here's a ladder. Here's the lawnmower. You'll be sore the next day. I can guarantee it. I'm not even going to charge. It's a free program. Anybody can come over and get that done. A again, that's what most people think a workout is. And, and we can work hard. And yes, you might be sore, but that's, it's just a different context than what most people are thinking. 
Yeah, hundred percent. And I think people get, uh, you know, I still fall victim to this sometimes, right? If I, uh, like at the refinery, right. Perfect example. I've been, I've been following a program that I'm, uh, working with my own coach for. And the other day I substituted one leg exercise for their new H squat. Have you seen that so giant behemoth cool. that they it's have amazing. in there? Yeah, it's cool. Yeah. Vintage piece, super rare. Um, shout out to John for, for putting that on the training floor. It's just awesome. But I did two sets on there and I could barely sit on the toilet the next day. Um, and it's not like I've not trained legs before, right? It's not like I haven't used a leg brace. It's just a totally foreign movement pattern. So that was enough um, to make me sore for four days afterwards, right? So if soreness is the goal, we've got an endless array of things that we can do to make you sore. If progress, if um, results are the goal, then soreness is, it's a nice marker in the beginning of a program. It feels good sometimes. It lets you know that you did something, but it has no um, long-term correlation with effectiveness at all. Yeah, I really appreciate that. And I know we've been dancing around some of the core tenets of your um, content, Exercises Bullshit. I, I find find it curious that a personal trainer would come up with the title exercises bullshit. Tell us what, how, how that came about. What was uh, the nexus of that idea? What things were you trying to communicate? And then let's get into some of the major principles that you're talking about that we haven't already mentioned already. Yeah. So, so with the book, obviously I wanted something that was catchy. That was, um, you know, would, would stick out on the end of your, um, end of your tongue. And then like visually when you see it, uh, would kind of pop off the shelf. So I, I was thinking of, um, Gosh, I forget the guy's name, um, but he was basically the first guy to put fuck on a cover of a book, and he sold like a bajillion copies. Mark Manson? Um, so it was like, yeah, Mark Manson. Yep. Yeah, what was that book called? Uh, it's Subtle like, Art of Not F Giving a Fuck. Book. Subtle Art of Not Giving a Fuck, right? So I always, that book cover always stood out to me, um, and it's a decent book. I mean, it's a it's a good good book and but it just did buku numbers and people like it's a talking point you have that on your shelf and somebody's never seen it before it goes what the hell is that um so that was part of the inspiration um and, and then also our industry is just so full of bullshit so i i wanted it to maybe draw on some people that that were uh opposed to exercise it, just on face value they don't like working hard they didn't want to do it and other people who maybe love exercise and go what is this guy talking about you know i was hoping to get uh, both ends of the spectrum there and then my sister had the the fantastic idea of actually making bullshit an acronym which it is now so bullshit actually stands for bros that's me you uh <laughs> using logical lifting and scientific heuristics to inform training so it's a bit of a double entendre there as well so there's so much bs in our industry and then i think just you know my my enthusiasm and excitement about exercise is is also with that acronym is bullshit right it's it's me getting excited and um wanting to talk about all things exercise science so that's kind of where the the title came from i love that very provocative i think you do a great job of capturing both ends of that spectrum as you said um so so what are the what are the kinds of things you want to clarify with your book uh, core tenets that again if, to you are bullshit that we need to do a better job communicating to our clients yeah, I mean, there, there's so many. I've got the I've got the format here. The book is currently like 450 pages, so nice, I'm probably right? going to have to trim it trim it down a little bit. Um, but basically, it's you know going through some of these main myths and misconceptions that we see in our industry, and I've not by any means captured uh, all of them on here, um, but just a few like single set training versus multi set training, um, cardiovascular exercise versus resistance. The idea that more is better, right? We, we kind of touched on there. If you're doing five days a week and it stops working, well, what do you have to do? Either you have to do six days or you have to start doing two a days. Um, you know, stretching for flexibility versus resistance training, training your core. Um, you need to rest when you're injured. So there, there's just so many things that are still perpetuated over and over again in our industry, which people like you and me that are, are so exposed to the, the most recent research and we talk and breathe and eat and live this stuff all the time, we would go, uh, people obviously know that that's bullshit. Uh, but then you talk to someone who's never done anything before and they're like, hey, uh, you know, shouldn't I be doing multiples, three sets of 10 of everything? Like, that's what I heard because they just started training. And that's the first thing that they got exposed to, just like we did, you know, 20 plus years ago when we started lifting. So I just think there's, you know, there's such a thirst for, for um, dispelling some of these myths 
And I'm by no means the the only voice in the industry that's trying to do it, but I'd like to be another voice that's, you know, fighting the good fight, if you will. Yeah, that's great. Okay. I tried to take notes where you were mentioning all of those. Those are great. Let's talk about that multiple set versus a single set. I think that's a big one. Um, tell us, t- clarify that for the listener and, and tell us like, you know, where, where the bullshit is with that and how we can do a better job communicating that again to our clients. Yeah. So, I mean, it it really just boils down to what are your goals and exercise as most of these, these topics, um, you know, like we we've kind of touched on too. It's like, it depends, right? What, what is your goal? Is your goal to be a a world-class power lifter? Well, then you probably shouldn't train to failure according to the research, at least not on a regular basis. And you should probably do a shit ton of volume practicing your movements, right? Um, whereas if your goal is just overall strength, hypertrophy, and feelings of wellness, then multi-set training is just not supported by the research at all, right? If we want to get a, a sufficient stimulus, I always think about it in the terms of sufficiency versus optimization. Optimization would be, um, I want to get as much as much muscle as humanly possible. I want to maximize my genetic potential. I want to be the best version of Casey Ruff that I could possibly be physically and physiologically. Well, to do that requires probably a lot of volume, probably requires a lot of smart recovery, probably requires some performance enhancing drugs. If we're talking about actually optimizing, but sufficiency maybe doesn't sound as sexy, but I would argue is more appropriate for about 99% of the population. That just means you're building as much muscle as you can with the least time commitment possible. It means you're getting basically all of the positive physiological, psychological, mental adaptations of resistance training and positive exercise um, with, again, a fraction of the time commitment. So when we look at sufficiency, like, do I want something that's just sufficient for my lifestyle? then there's no justification that I can see, especially after you've trained for a little while of doing anything more than one, maybe two sets of an exercise, just if you're working by yourself and you can't quite get to the uh, needed intensity level to stimulate the, um, the proper requirements for growth and stimulus over time. Um, but definitely don't need to do three sets. Definitely don't need to do five sets. Definitely don't need to do 20 sets in a single workout of a a single particular exercise. I'm glad you clarified that point that especially if you've got some experience doing this, you don't need to do that. When I'm first starting with somebody, they're not used to going to that type of an intensity. And I'll explain it like, I'm, I'm going to be counting reps. I don't really care. And the saying goes, we count reps, but reps don't count. Like your body doesn't know whether you did something 12 times or 20 times or two times. It doesn't care just as long as it gets to that level of intensity we were talking about before. And when somebody's just getting started, they're not, again, used to pushing that deep into the workout. And the more experience somebody has and the closer somebody gets to testing that, I do find that we start to reduce and reduce and reduce the number of sets that we're doing from, you know, three to two and possibly one, and then maybe add more advanced techniques. Like maybe we'll do a drop set. Like if you're lifting a hundred pounds, on a chest press and you can't move that weight anymore, you might set the weight down. Let's drop, you know, 25 pounds and keep going and do the same again and again. Like there's other things you can do, but you can still make that fit in one, or like you said, maybe two fits to achieve that sufficiency that again is probably going to be 90%, 95% of what you need. It doesn't have to be a hundred of what's going to make you optimal. It's just, it's so unrealistic anyway, right? Yeah. And there's so many other levers that people could be pulling if they want to actually optimize, you know, air quotes, optimize their health, like resistance training is a huge part of it. But if you're, you know, doing 20 sets per muscle group per week, and you're trying to maximize uh, the amount of hypertrophy and strength that you gain, and you're eating again, like an asshole outside of there, like you're never going to optimize, right? So you can do significantly less volume, get a lot of the same benefits. And then if you also pull some of those other major levers, sleep, diet, uh, daily movement, um, you're you're going to get so much closer to that optimal point with so much less time investment. And again, for most people, now the, the big caveat here is if you like going to the gym, go to the gym, do three sets, do five. I don't give a shit. But if your goal is I want to get the, the, the prize, but I don't want to have to do 
five days a week at the gym, six days a week at the gym. Okay, well, there's a great option for that. And it's called high intensity training. And you can do a single set of each exercise, again, within reason, after you kind of learn the skill of intensity and how to push yourself. Yeah, I love that. Very well explained. Okay, another concept I think most people have a tough time wrapping their head around is the cardiovascular thing. Now, you will notice this when you see me at the refinery. There's going to be some days in the summertime, with summertime now, where I'm going to be coming, I'm going to be kitted out in my boundless body cycling kit because I rode my bike into the, the refinery. I do, I do cardio because there's things that I love to do that if you told me they were harmful, I wouldn't care. I love to mountain bike. I love to be on my road bike. You could probably classify that as cardio, although I would argue at the heart rate ranges I'm working at, it's, it's fairly low intensity. But most people have this idea of like, if I'm, I, first of all, I need cardio. The idea that it's even called cardio is quite interesting how we even came onto that. Um, and people just, they get so, so they fall in love with the calorie tracker on a treadmill, for example, or the numbers of calories burned on their Apple watch. And so they just, they think this is the best thing I could be, possibly be doing is again, quote unquote, cardiovascular exercise. How do you write about that in your book? Yeah. So I, I specifically in this, this chapter talk about cardio uh, vascular exercise versus resistance training from a weight loss perspective. And there's multiple arguments to be had here. Like, can you improve your cardiovascular performance without actually doing traditional cardio? And the answer uh, is yes, right? But ag again, it depends on the specifics of what you're doing. Now, all those things you mentioned, um, your mountain biking, all of that stuff, those are those are not exercise, right? I would define that as, as recreation, which is great. And that could fall into the daily intentional movement category. That can be a great way long-term um, to add some some energy expenditure over the course of the day without a huge tax um, on your metabolism um, and and increasing the amount that you want to eat afterwards because you've created such a, a negative uh, tax there. So um, with resistance training specifically, though, for weight loss, the reason it's so much more beneficial than cardio is you mentioned the little ticker on those machines or on the watches. Uh, there's been multiple studies done now, specifically on like smartwatches and smart trackers that show that some uh, brands are off by over 95% in their caloric estimation, right? So if it says you burned 100 calories, uh, you might have burned five. Now, that seems wild, right? Um, but it's, it's, it's true. Like there's none that are 100% accurate. And the only way to actually get perfect calorimetry is to like be in a contained environment, right? So there's so many things fluctuating. What else have you done that day? So many other factors, right? So I always say using those apps, using the, uh, the watches, whatever it might be, just as a general guideline, but realizing too, that they're jacking those numbers up, even if they were completely accurate, the other thing that they're including, which again, they're not, but if, even if they were, they're also including your basal metabolic rate into there. So say you go onto the treadmill, you burn 200 calories in an hour. Well, you might've burned a hundred of those just by sitting on your ass, right. right? And they're, they're using the algorithm to find out. That's why they ask you what your age and your weight and all of those things are is because they're putting that into the algorithm that's going to calculate your calories burned. So the amount of calories you actually burn, the net calories is maybe a hundred, right? But then you apply that to, oh, I can have a cookie later or something else. Um, the other issue with cardio, especially long form, uh, higher duration cardiovascular exercise is that it increases your satiety or I'm sorry, your, um, hunger hormones. So you end up burning, say, 500 calories on a long run, and then you overeat an additional 500 calories. The problem is that it's not an even trade, meaning over the course of the rest of the day, your metabolism slows down to compensate for the calories that you burned. So if you were to burn, say, 2,000 calories on a regular day, you spike uh, the additional 500 calories from that run, well, now your metabolism could potentially slow down an additional 500 calories that day just to get you back to baseline. Now, this is a constantly evolving thing, right? It happens day to day. It's it's a moving target. But if every day you justify your poor dietary decisions by continuing to um, add back in those calories that you supposedly lost, that's where it can be really, really tough for people who are like, I am doing all this exercise. Where is the weight going, right? Um, now, on the flip side of that, the benefit of resistance training is even though it doesn't burn very many calories when you're doing it, right? A really hard resistance training session, what we did um, at the refinery together, you maybe burned 150 calories. Um, it was way not, more not than that. Amount. Come on, man. Way more yeah. than that. But 
potentially you built some muscle when we were there, right? And what we do know is that any muscle that you add is going to allow you to burn more calories at rest, right? So the benefit of resistance training, besides burning a little calories in the moment, you also get a slight afterburn effect, if you want to call it that, where you, you could actually potentially raise your, uh, your metabolic rate, uh, for about 48 to 72 hours afterwards, you also are adding in more muscle mass, right? So you're burning more calories long-term. Usually if you do a hard workout, you're not extremely hungry afterwards. So you might even suppress appetite. So you're actually decreasing potentially the amount of calories that you would consume that day too. So it's just stacking in, in the negatives, right? In a good way. Um, so that's, that's where the benefit, especially over the long term of resistance training is, I mean, it's not even close when it comes to, to cardio for weight loss. Could Sorry it, if that was too long of a ramble. That was a, a great answer. And this is where we're going to insert the star Wars meme. It's a trap. The cardio, it's such a trap. And the best example after working on a metabolic cart, you know, for 13 years, I saw it all the time with the over exercisers. They, they would be cold in the summertime. They would have, you know, carry fat around the midsection even if they were lean in the in the extremities they'd always be hungry always want to be snacking all of those things we know from a suppressed metabolic rate the best one i ever did or not the best but one of the the better examples was a woman who had just been kicked off of the biggest loser based on her numbers her age height weight and gender where we assumed her basal metabolic rate would have been was close to 2000 calories and we measured her right around 1000 calories so she was already burning 1000 calories less every single day and the horror stories of what they put her through it was like 6 hours a day of workout they were on very tightly controlled 1200 calorie, uh, you know, workouts or I'm sorry, calorie, um, intakes with their food. So very limited food intake, tons of calories burned with workout and, and it completely wrecked her metabolism. No wonder they all gained, you know, all the way back after the contest. There's no, you know, where are they now? Biggest loser shows out there because it doesn't work. It, it creates the exact perfect environment for weight gain. It, it's perfect. Like it's, it's exactly the opposite of what people don't want. Yeah, that that actually reminds me. I need to add a chapter about Ozempic and some of that other oh, stuff. Oh man, um, now that that's such a, a topic as well. But it's it's this, generally the same idea, right? When you're taking a, and we don't have to go too far down the GLP uh, train, but essentially, you know, if if we want to use something like Ozempic or any one of those other weight loss drugs, they're indiscriminate with the tissue that you're losing. Meaning, if you lose fifty pounds, odds are it's going to be fifty fifty muscle and fat. Now, that's great from a net perspective. You're down lower. Technically, you've improved um, your markers of, of health and longevity if you lose a significant amount of weight. The problem becomes now you've also drastically decreased the amount of calories that you need at rest, right? So if you've lost 25 pounds of muscle, that is a significant decrease in your basal metabolic rate. Um, now you come off, you try to eat the same thing you're eating before, but now your appetite's not suppressed. You gain 50 pounds back. Well, now it's 50 pounds of fat yep. more than likely, right? So it, it's just a, it's unfortunate to say the least of, of what maybe some of the long-term ramifications, not even to mention some of the side effects of some of these drugs, but the long-term ramifications. So if anybody is ever thinking about doing that, for God's sakes, strength train while you are taking those drugs. You have to, have to, have to strength train while you're doing it. Absolutely. That's really, really great advice. Okay, awesome. Another concept that you mentioned earlier, this is like sacred cow. I don't even need to ask somebody if this is a good idea. Everybody ubiquitously knows stretch I need to stretch. Stretching is a good idea. You do it before exercise. You do it during commercial breaks if, if necessary. It's just a good thing that everybody should be doing. Can you explain how you think about stretching? Yeah, stretching is great. I actually have a, uh, a 200 hour RYT yoga certification. I like stretching. I have, I have nothing against stretching. Um, do I think that the, the preponderance of research supports that it's beneficial? No. Um, now the caveat there is if your goal is to improve range of motion, static stretching, a stretching routine is beneficial. It's going to improve your range of motion. There's no debating there, right? Stretching works for improving range of motion. Here's the caveat to that. So does resistance training, right? So it, it's not one or the other necessarily. It's again, it's about, um, how much do you value your time? where do you want to get the most bang for your buck for? And it's pretty unequivocal now that if you work through a full range of motion in your resistance training routine or as close to a full range of motion as possible, the benefits in, in range of motion and flexibility that you get from resistance training are equivalent to, if not even maybe slightly better than just a static uh, normal stretching routine. 
with the huge added benefit of you're also improving everything else that you would improve through resistance training. So to me, if the goal is one or the other, it's not even a conversation. You have to resistance train. Um, if the goal is I like stretching and I also am going to resistance train, freaking go for it. Like go do yoga. I don't care. Um, go take a, a stretch, whatever class. Um, just probably don't do it right before you come to your resistance training session. Um, but again, it's it, like if you're doing it because you think you need it, well, you're misinformed. Um, the evidence is very clear on that. If you're doing it because you like it, knock yourself out. Go do whatever you want. It's yeah. America. How many times in your career have you heard somebody say their goals and they say, like, I really would like to do the splits? And it's like, okay, but like, why? And, you know, it's not usually hockey goalies or cheerleaders that are the ones saying, I need to be, I want to be able to do the splits. It's somebody that, you know, maybe could do them 20 years ago and now they can and they think they want to. But but digging down a little deeper, like, well, why do you want to do that? There's hardly ever a really good reason that somebody wants to do that, right? Well, it's just because they're equating when they were in better shape when they could do the splits, right? They don't they don't necessarily care about doing the splits. They care about being the same size and weight and muscle mass as they were when they were 18 when they could do it. Um, and and those two things are just falsely equated together. And honestly, if they lost the weight, if they lost uh, you know, the the weight that they'd gained over the past, say, 20, 30 years, um, and improve their strength, they might actually be able to do the splits again. Uh, but is that important? If you, like you said, if you dig down, probably not that important to them. Yeah. Okay. So I'm wondering then on the, on the note of stretching, you mentioned core training as well. This is not something that I don't do with my people. Um, it's probably just really baked in to my very first certification, which was NASM, which talks a lot about core stabilization. And I will do some of that with my clients, like as a warm up to get used to, you know, exercise, especially if we're doing an hour long session, we'll take a few minutes and do a few exercises to kind of get going with that. Could we put core training in the same category as stretching as far as like, if you like it, if you enjoy this, yes, you can do this. Um, but this is definitely not where you want to be spending most of your time to be the most time efficient. Yeah, definitely from a time efficiency perspective, it's it's pretty unnecessary, right? Unless because the the big lever that you have to pull if you want to see the benefit cuz what do people actually want to train their cores for? Like what's what do they want? That's not rhetorical. Tell me what you think they want. I mean, honestly, a lot of people think they want to lose fat in that area and so they think they need to do a lot of sit-ups to be able to lose yeah. fat. Yeah. And they want to be able to see their six pack or they've been following some Instagram influencer. And the reality is, and I'll tell people this is that it doesn't matter how many crunches you do. We're not seeing that six pack unless you lose 50 pounds of fat that's sitting on top of it. Right. So, um, I think the nice thing about the style of training that we do, and especially if you're doing large multi-joint movements as sort of the foundation of your training is you're going to get sufficient core, if you want to call it that stimulus. Now, really what I would focus on from a core perspective would be back strengthening with most people. Most people are extremely front dominant, right? So they're, they're getting plenty of work, especially if they're doing big compound joint pulling movements um, in their rectus abdominis and their obliques, like they're getting all of that. What they're not getting a lot of the times is the erector spinae and those low back muscles. Um, so to add in some, like if we're talking what is core, it's the whole midsection, right? It's not just the front that looks good, right? But nobody really wants to, you know, have their back straps look better for the most part. Uh, but that's really the focus that I would put on, on emphasizing if somebody was doing core strength. Now, if you have somebody who does come to you, that's maybe a competitive athlete, um, like they're doing a, a bodybuilding show, or they, they already are pretty lean, and they maybe want to see an improvement in the appearance of their abdominals, I would just apply the same principles that I would to any other exercise, right? Like we can do some specific core abdominal training, um, but we're not going to do 20 sets of it. Like the, the rectus abdominis is no different than the biceps is no different than the latissimus dorsi, right? Like one set, maybe two sets, maybe three uh, in a single workout, but probably spreading the volume out over the course of the week um, to target that area directly. But I don't think you need any special stuff. Now, all that being said, again, it goes into what a client's like. And if somebody's paying you a decent amount of money and they want to come in and they want to work their core, 
I don't know. You can go for it. Yeah. yeah. Literally the dude that hired me a few years ago uh, before a trip to like Croatia or something, he hired me twice a week for four months to do biceps and chest. And that's it. Like one day was bicep. One day was chest. I had to discover every single way to do a, a bicep <laughs> curl in the gym. Uh, okay. Mm-hmm. Last one. We've, we've mentioned this quite a bit, but I just want to reiterate because this is another one that I think for most people is really, really mind blowing more is is not necessarily better especially for somebody who's just getting started they they are really chomping at the bit they want to get after it they want to hit the gym six days a week how are you helping somebody understand that more is not necessarily better yeah i i think once you you know again i was talking to jay vincent the other day and and one of the things we we chatted about was most people are so oblivious to what hard work actually looks like right so if you can get them in the gym especially if they're in front of you or if you're working with them remotely like i do now and you can demonstrate to them what failure looks like what that in level of required intensity actually looks like you can very easily get to the point where after a, a single set you go do you feel like doing another one right now? And once they get to that point where they go, no, I, I fucking don't. I don't think I could. Okay. But like we've, we've turned the the dial to where now they understand you don't need that additional stimulus. Um, once you've turned the light on, you can't turn it back on again. Right. So if we're working with sufficient intensity on a particular muscle group, um, you don't, you don't need to, to hit it again. Um, now again, this all, all goes back into your goals and things as well. I think most people, if they're being honest, don't really care about, they want to be a physique athlete or they want to, you know, look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. They just want to feel better. Right. And if your goal is to feel better and get the benefits of resistance training, you do not need a huge amount of volume. You simply don't. Uh, now, if you have other goals, if you're a strength athlete, if you're a physique athlete, if you've got uh, sports performance goals, then yeah, maybe there's some some things we need to take into consideration as far as building your program. But for the average person that just wants to feel and look better, you just simply don't need a huge amount of volume, especially in the beginning, to see big improvements in strength, body composition, physiology, all of that stuff. My favorite part about all of this information and everything that we talked about today is I think it makes it so much more approachable for people who have felt like they've tried all of these things and paid so much money to all these programs and memberships and all this BS out there, <laughs> all the bullshit. And like this is this is different information that makes it so much more accessible. You don't need endless amounts of time. It is very helpful to have somebody coach you through some of these things, and so very much consider hiring a trainer. But like this is approachable, and people can do this. And I just I, I really want that message to get out there and, and, and have people have hope that regardless of where they are, they can accomplish what they need with without spending tons of money and doing this, all this stuff. So I just, I really love your information. I really have loved this conversation. Where would you like people to go, Logan, to find you and connect with you and your work? Yeah. So the podcast will hopefully be out in the beginning of, uh, let's see, what's, what's Q3, that would be September, something like that, end of August, early September. Um, so uh, check that out. It's going to be exercises bullshit wherever you stream stuff. Um, as far as as finding more information or potentially working with us doing that 63 day transformation, it's just uh, www.reformed-fitness.com. My email there is logan at reformed-fitness.com. Um, you can also reach me on my personal at logan erlahi at gmail.com. Um, I've got an Instagram. It's logan emmett e m m e t t erlahi. Um, yeah, I can't think. I can't think of any other places. Buy the buy the book I already wrote. Buy the new one that's coming out. Um, that'll hopefully be out by the by the end of the year. Is is sort of my goal for that. Excellent. Tons of rumors swirling around about the guests you have on the Exercises Bullshit podcast. I hear there's one in particular that's just off the charts. I'm assuming that you're talking about I, yourself. I'm definitely talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I'm I'm excited to launch that, man. There's there's been a lot of of cool people that I've had the opportunity to talk to, and a lot of other people that. Um, have shown interest in, in wanting to do it. And I'm just, you know, obviously I haven't launched anything yet, but I'm I'm just super, I, I honestly, I'd love this show to do well, but I'm really just so excited to get back into doing a podcast and, and being able to talk about the things that I enjoy. Yeah, and amazing. I think there's so much value to be had. So that's amazing. Well, Logan, I'm so yeah. lucky to be able to consider you a friend. Thank you for taking time out of your busy day to of course, come man. with us and chat with us. We really appreciate you. Thanks for having me on, man. It's always a pleasure. It's good to see you. Good to see you as well. And this has been another episode of Boundless Body Radio.
Thank you so very much for listening to and supporting Boundless Body Radio. This podcast is such a passion of mine, one of my favorite parts about running our business, and none of this would be possible without our incredible guests and listeners like yourself. Thank you so, so very much for all of the amazing reviews that we get on Apple and Spotify. Trust me, we read them all, and it means the world to hear that you are enjoying the show as well. I am very excited to announce that this summer, I will be hosting a nutrition seminar series. This is actually a project that I started after I became certified as a nutrition coach. I wanted to get a group of people together to discuss all aspects of human nutrition. And as a bonus, I did the whole thing outside by a pool, which was great. After the pandemic, I stopped hosting the series, but this year I've decided to bring it back. Each week, we'll have a particular topic and an agenda. We'll have outlines that include references and also meal plans, guest appearances, book giveaways, and more, all for free. For those of you who live in the Salt Lake City area, the seminars will be hosted every Tuesday at noon, starting on May 28th, and will run all the way until September 3rd. The seminar will be hosted outside, of course, at the beautiful Bowery Park in Daybreak, where I live. If you're available and in the area, we would absolutely love to see you there. If you are unable to attend, either that day and time does not work for you, or you don't live in the area, good news for you as well, we are going to put all the recordings and post them on YouTube, where you can submit listener questions in the comment section, which we can address in future seminars. I'm also including all of the seminar materials on our website, so you don't have to miss out on the content. My goal is to make a comprehensive yet simple understanding of nutrition so that anybody confused about how they should eat can create a framework for themselves based on their individual goals. As I said, if you're interested in participating, we'd love to have you. If you can't make it into the in-person seminar, be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also our website at myboundlessbody.com slash seminar to find all the resources, videos, and a fun quiz. Either way, thank you as always for listening to Boundless Body Radio.